there are decades when nothing happens and there are weeks when decades happen. I like this because this illustrates the unintuitiveness of exponential functions and I really like exponential functions. I, I would like to marry an exponential function if I could. Something stuck with me when I was researching you. You said aging is an exponential problem, but we develop linear solutions for that. That's right. And the way I see it is that uh, when we think about the aging problem or the aging opportunity, one of the things that handicaps us in this is that we do perceive aging as linear because, you know, every year it's another birthday and I don't feel that much different. And so it feels like it's a linear process. And yet when we look at our our grandparents or our parents or whatever, we see that aging is not linear at all. We see that people age so much more between 70 and 80 or 80 and 90 or 90 and 100 than they did between 30 and 40 and 40 and 50, for example. So we know that it's not linear. And yet when we think about it, like, for example, if I were to ask you, what are you going to be like 10 years from now? What are you going to be like 15 years from now? What are you going to be like 20 years from now? If I ask myself the same question, what am I going to be like 20 years from now? It's almost impossible for me to imagine I'm going to be any different than I am right now, right? So even though we can see all around us that aging is an exponential problem, we have a very hard time relating to it. And <clears throat> we can't feel it. It's another birthday. I don't feel that much different. And so we know that aging is happening and we get to a point where we can feel the aging process in us. We can't run as fast. We don't look the same in the mirror. We don't, you know, our hairline is different, whatever it is, we put on weight or whatever. But we still feel like, well, if I just did a couple things, I'd get back to where I was. Um, and then people get to a point where they're like, well, I don't think I can get back to where I was. So then they starting to feel that aging process. But even then, they don't, they have a hard time appreciating the exponential decline that's about to occur. And so the strategies that are put forward to deal with aging, like, well, let's get healthy, right? Let's start eat be to eat better and I'll exercise every day and I'll learn to meditate and I'll decrease my stress and I'll create better relationships and, you know, things like that. All wonderful things, all necessary. But everybody that ever did that still that got old and died, right? Everybody that ever did that got old and died. Everybody you know, now we're in the age of biohacking. It's like, okay, well, let's let's try to manipulate the biology, right? And a lot of that is let's ma manipulate the biology, but we really kind of avoid talking about the psycho-spiritual, which really has such a dramatic impact on health and longevity. Um, that I think when you look at things like a get healthy and a biohacking strategy even put together is still a linear response to an exponential problem because it doesn't really get at the heart of the matter. So that's kind of my my basic thought about it. What are the ramifications here? Like what kind of responses can we have then? Yes. <clears throat> so I think it comes down to understanding <clears throat> um, what does an exponential strategy look like? for an exponential problem. If aging is exponential, uh, then what does an exponential strategy look like? And I, and I will just interject here that there's another exponential that goes on for us in our lives. And that is that every decade, right? <clears throat> even from age 10, maybe going forward, every decade, we have access to more opportunity and can make a bigger impact on the world than the decade prior, right? Like, just think about what you did in between 10 and 20 and 20 and 30 and 30 and 40, whatever. And as I go through the decades for myself, it's like, oh, my gosh, you know, my ability to have an impact and, and access opportunity grows exponentially. So the tragedy of life is that we have this growing exponential, right? And you're, you love exponentials. So now you're in the middle of this growing exponential for yourself. And yet when that exponential decline, when those lines cross, right, and all of a sudden, then it's like, you can no longer access that exponential opportunity, which is quite honestly part of the joy of life. Um, and so it's also the tragedy of life that as people are becoming very, very, what shall I say, enhanced or uh, enlarged in terms of their ability to make impact and access opportunity, their health actually 
goes away and now they they lose that capacity. So therein lies the tragedy of life. I mean, there are many tragedies, I suppose, but that's one in particular. So when I think about aging, what I've come to realize is that it's not about, you know, what is longevity? It's not really about living a long time. That's not what longevity is. Um, longevity for me, because if you just live a long time, you could live a long time in a nursing home. You could live a long time, you know, being incapacitated. And to me, that's not really what anybody's going for. So for me, it's about actually being young, right? Like when we're young, when we're physiologically and psychologically and spiritually young, the world is our oyster. Everything is an opportunity. And <clears throat> taking that mindset forward through the decades becomes a critical component of developing an exponential strategy. And the reason I say that is because in life, we only ever get the answers to the questions that we're asking. And so if if I'm going, I just had a birthday. I just, I, I wake up 27 every day, just so the audience understands that. I wake up 27. I just had a birthday. I completed 70 laps around the sun, um, right? So technically I'd be 70 years old, but but I'm not, right? And <clears throat> I can tell you that it's so powerful. Why 27? Why 27? Well, when I was 27, I was in medical school. I was uh, voraciously learning and loving what I was doing. I had good friends. I was in the middle of what felt like an exponential explosion in my life, right? Transitioning from being uh, a normal citizen into being a physician. And uh, that was definitely an exponential growth uh, period of my life. Um, and so I relate to the energy that I had at that point in time. I have that same energy now, right, for the exponential growth in terms of understanding aging and, and human life and how to optimize them. Um, so I chose 27 because it resonates with me. The other reason I chose it is because I plan to be 27 for another decade. When I turn 80, I'll be 28 for a decade. When I turn 90, I'll be 29 for a decade. And that way, when I'm 100, I'll be 30. And the book I wrote is 100 is the new 30. So it gives me some some area to kind of grow into that, if you will. So that's kind of the humorous side of it. But I choose to be 27 because I think one of the worst things that people can do is identify with an age, right? I, I mean, what we think and the questions we ask really determine who we are. So if somebody says, oh, I'm getting older, oh, I'm old, oh, I, I shouldn't be doing that anymore because I'm at this age. Right. I need to stop skiing. I shouldn't hike this mountain. I need to whatever um, you, you bring that to me. I'm not going to walk over there to get it. Right. All those things just reinforce the aging process. But if I wake up 27, it's like, oh, I can do anything I want. You want to go run four miles? Yeah, let's go. You want to ride mountain bikes? Let's go. Let's want to snowboard? Yeah, let's go snowboard. Right. Because I'm 27. And then if I wake up and I don't feel 27, then I ask the question. Not how do I adapt to being 70 years old, but how do I actually maintain myself at 27? And when you ask that question, you start to find those answers. And that's what's transformative for people is asking the right questions. So that's kind of how I think about it. According to the Longevity Olympics leaderboard, you are the 20th slowest aging people in the world. Okay. And your chronological age is... Uh, 69 there, uh, yep. they're 70 now, yep. and your Dunedin pace, pace of aging is 0 0.84, and mine is 0 0.89, mm. so that means I'm about 30, so 27 is just about right for you, <laughs> based on <laughs> there this. You go. There you go. Well, a bit it's younger than me. Thing. Yeah, this is an interesting <laughs> point you bring up, because the rate of aging does fluctuate. For example, um, if you if you get COVID, your rate of aging will increase. Um, if you adopt healthy lifestyle patterns, your rate of aging will decrease. So as people hear about this, and what we're talking about here is DNA methylation patterns being measured by a company called TrueAge, which is basically looking at how carbon with three hydrogens or methyl groups get attached and unattached from the DNA. And Steve Horvath really described this, right? In all mammals, for example, as people or animals live, the, the pattern with which these methyl groups, these carbons with the three hydrogens get attached or unattached from the DNA correlates to aging. And the attachment of a carbon uh, uh, with three hydrogens or a methyl group or the unattachment of it determines how the DNA is expressed. And so 
you can have DNA expression uh, that's similar to a 27 year old. And again, this is David Sinclair's work about kind of reprogramming the cell, reprogramming the methylation age of the cell to actually behave like a younger cell to, to do the things a younger cell does. But the point is that rate of aging is, is one metric. And I know it's, it's basically touted in the Olympics, but there are many, or a mosaic of many, many ages. And so I find it interesting, but I'm not married to that particular age, right? If it's 0.84 or 0.89 or whatever it is, it's important, but there's so many other ages to take into account. Um, and I think people get lost sometimes in a single metric. So I wouldn't beat yourself up over that, right? You, you, uh, you need to know more ages for yourself. What's your brain age? What's your heart age? What's your blood vessel age? Things like that. Yeah. And uh, I would like to also note that this is a linear metric, like uh, slowing down, optimizing against the pace of aging of, uh, of Dunedin pace would be a linear um, solution to the exponential problem. You would actually have to like somehow like you start to age and then you, you should you should get back to your previous state and then you start to age again. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And I, what I've found is that the entire psycho spiritual conversation um, is really left out for the most part in these conversations about aging. And yet when I think about aging, <clears throat> you know, my goal for aging, some people are like, Oh, I want to live to be a hundred. I want to be 120. I want to be 180. I want to live 370 years. I want to live 780 years. I mean, quite honestly, that is such an abstraction, right? It's such an abstraction because it's hard to relate to ourselves being 10 years older, let alone 200 years older, right? So the thing we can relate to, though, is being youthful, right? And <clears throat> I think the other piece of it is that for me, the concept of, of longevity is not living a long time. It's actually when I'm 100, being 30 years old, and having a 300 year old mind, right? With all the wisdom and all the equanimity and all the foresight and all the tranquility that comes from having that 300 year old mind, all the wisdom, right? And I think to all me, that madness. really becomes the target. That really becomes the target. And I think everybody's focused on, well, I just want to live a long time and I want to be healthy while I'm doing it. It's like, okay, so let's say you're going to be around for another hundred years. Is that it? You're just going to play more golf and, and have more businesses and see more grandkids is that that's really all there is to me it's more about how do we actually become the full expression of who we are in this whole psycho spiritual sphere that's that's kind of my idea what 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 will happen in a thousand years um i i know you are you are a big fan of games i'm not actually sure in which uh, which way but uh, but what will happen in a thousand years uh, are you familiar with uh, Bernard Suits uh, uh, grasshopper's argument? Uh, what what will happen when when we solve all the scarcity of the world? Mm -hmm. um, when we solve all, uh, all the scarcity of the world, then 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 what can we do? Like everything everything comes easy. Technology technology just solved everything. So the right. only activity left to do for us is playing games, putting unnecessary obstacles in our ways to challenge ourselves. I, I would I would say that <clears throat> I would say that games are a really important part of life. Um, you know, I think play is actually a very important part of life. Children, as they grow up, you know, people used to be very dismissive. Oh, they're just over there playing. But actually, play is such an important way to learn, to experiment, to grow, to understand, to see what works, what doesn't work. Um, and playing games is another way to do that, to learn how to strategize, to learn how to think, to solve problems. So all that's really, really important for both intellectual development, personal development. Um, and I continue to play games to this day simply because I find them fun and entertaining. And I'm always looking for a different way to figure them out. And I'm trying new and different games. Um, there's a game called Clask that uh, my college roommate is extremely good at. He has very good hand-eye coordination. I don't have as good a hand-eye coordination as he does, but I enjoy playing it with my partner because she has very good hand-eye coordination. And it's an opportunity to see, okay, how can I figure this game out? I think games are really important, but if I think about it, 
I think that there's more to life than playing games. When, when AI or, or computers or whatever, when we have free energy and we have plenty of food and we have access to nutrient-dense food and clean water and clean air, when all that's taken care of, I really think the meaning in life, although games are interesting, I think the meaning in life, quite honestly, becomes being on a track to really expand into the full expression of who we are, the full understanding of who we are mentally, spiritually, physically, and then the relationships that we develop around that with other people, right? And I think that becomes endlessly fascinating uh, in terms of how we continue to grow and expand. Uh, so uh, I would say that I would put that above games, although I think games are super fun and I, I see that games will probably always be in our future. So, so, so I've been, I've been well versed in the philosophy of games and the philosophy of value, and I couldn't really um, put them together just yet. But uh, I believe you just said something similar to what the thinking is at the philosophy of value, which is that we are value-seeking creatures, and we are in this world trying to enhance our and our value and the value of our environment, uh, by extension, we are also our environment. It's a longer argument. Mm -hmm. And, 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 and yeah, yeah. I would agree with no. you. Let me just interject this. I would agree with you that we are value driven, that we, we are drawn to create things of value. And I think there will always be the opportunity to create things of value for human beings. Right. And how do you measure value? Well, you measure the value relative to your own joy. Uh, an appreciation of it, and you rel measure value in terms of the joy and appreciation that you bring to other people, right? And so I think there will always be opportunity for that. Kindness will never go away. Love will never go away. Generosity will never go away, right? Equanimity and wisdom will never go away. In fact, there'll probably be a greater need for it. I don't know, there's a pretty large need for it right now, but I can't imagine that ever going away. And I think there's so much satisfaction for humans in stepping into that that place, uh, that 300 year old mind, you know, that that smiles and enjoys the the gift of being here on the planet, right? This is such a gift, right? We, we're, we're stressed all the time. But actually, when you stop for a second and say, Oh, my gosh, what a beautiful day. Can you see that tree over there? It's just unbelievably beautiful, right? What a gift. When you start to live in that place, and I think we'll have more opportunity to live there as some of these other more, let's call it more menial things are taken care of. I think it's really important to realize that there's so much area to expand into in this psycho spiritual philosophical space. Um, so anyway, that would be my take. Mm -hmm. Okay, let, let, let's let's continue this philosophical uh, examination a little bit. Okay. I, I I've read a book, but uh, this is not a book. This is a this is a book disguised as a game. So okay. it's a it's a it's a game where where you you read a lot of text. <laughs> That's the game to read a okay. lot of text and right. choose some options and stuff like that. It's called Planescape Torment. And the story there is that there is this immortal person who cannot die. Uh, that's that's you. And what you're trying to do there is you're trying to find a way to die before your mind goes mad by by not being able to ever die, right? Because if you have an existence that you cannot stop yourself, then it's just a matter of time before your mind goes goes mad. So that's not 300 years though. <laughs> right, 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 right. It's not. Um, well, it's an interesting premise first off, right? I mean, the assumptions are always the things to look at first. And the assumption is that the mind would go crazy if it continued to expand into the full expression of being, let's call it. Um, I'm not sure that's the case. I think, I don't think that you would go mad. I think you would actually reach a piece of, uh, place of deep peace and joy, quite honestly, and generativity. So, so I would have to say that I don't really agree with the assumption of the game. But let's say that the assumption of the game is true, right? Just for argument's sake. Well, if that's the case, then I think it would be interesting for me to expand into all the different generative things that I could do while I'm still alive. And yet if madness was around the corner, I would have the opportunity to opt out, right? And it'd be like, uh, okay, I'll leave, right? And I, I don't know how I would orchestrate that exactly, but I, I, would, I would leave because it'd be like, I don't wanna live 
in that state. I don't want to become a negative contributor to the environment of the society that I'm in. I don't want to become a burden to other people. And I'll simply exit. And, you know, you see this in people all the time. They get to a point in their life now where they know they are going to die, but they get to a point where they no longer want to live. It's like, I've had enough. I'm ready to go. I've heard this from from many people. Um, and And I think that if somebody's ready to go, and it's not like, well, they're just feeling depressed and they'll get over this and they'll feel a lot better in two weeks, but they're really, there's just so much decline that there's no way out. Then I think allowing people to go is, is, is really a humane thing to do. Right. So, yeah. Yes, it is. Um, I, I believe people have the right, unconditional right to do what they want to do with their own body, even mm -hmm. if that's exiting anyhow. Let's let let's let's switch a bit of gears and talk about you. Okay. Can you tell me about some of your statistics here? Is the Dunedin pace still still correct? Uh, the zero point eighty four, or did you do a new test? Uh, did you do biological age tests? Can you tell me about what yeah. you know? So the last about your... first thing to realize is that True Age is actually changing their testing protocols. Um, so they started off when Steve Horvath basically developed the DNA methylation clocks, they were trying to use those clocks to actually predict the chronological age of either uh, an animal or a human, right? Because this, this clock tends to apply to all mammals. And then in the second generation of the clock, they were trying to predict a biological age. Then um, <clears throat> the grim age came out, which was basically a series of markers that would predict when somebody was going to die. Then they found out from this study in New Zealand, in this town, Dunedin uh, Pace, uh, and I never pronounce it properly either. But Dunedin. <laughs> yeah, Dunedin and Pace uh, in New Zealand, these people. Then they, then they were basically trying to say that this rate of aging correlated more to risk of death and um, time that you might be alive before you die than the Grim Age did, right? <clears throat> and so... And now in the latest iteration, they're actually realizing uh, the fallacy of simply assigning one metric of aging to an individual. I had conversations with them. I've known Ryan Smith for years, and I had these conversations with him and said, you know, you're, you're reporting out on this extrinsic and intrinsic age, which takes into account the immune system or doesn't. But in actual fact, we're really a mosaic of many ages. Right. I have many, many ages, and so, so does everyone else. And I said, you know, this is misleading to say that, you know, because my, my uh, DNA methylation age is 10 years younger than my chronological age, that, oh, I'm good and everything's wonderful. Because, you know, it can be very misleading. Somebody, in my case, my kidneys were damaged when I was five years old. I had a strep throat and my kidneys were damaged. And so those have always been sort of my weak spot, if you will. In fact, I would be younger still if my kidneys were better, right? Because they, it leads to more inflammation and more issues for me to have to deal with. Um, that being said, you know, I accept the challenge. It's like, okay, well, everybody's got, everybody's got something to deal with. Um, so let me take this on. But I think now what they're doing is in their latest testing, they're actually starting to, to give 11 different organ systems and try to give the ages of those organ systems and give you the age of your immune system um, and do some other things. So they're starting to broaden this out into, can we actually predict from DNA methylation patterns, you know, what your cardiovascular disease is or risk for disease is, what your lung disease, COPD risk is, what's your risk for cancer, you know, these other different things. Can we predict that? And what we find is that since we're already measuring all those things anyway, right, we do very, very in-depth testing for an individual. Um, we can see what we actually measure and what they're predicting. And in many cases, they don't line up, right? So when we measure somebody's actual immune system's age, we can do this through UCLA, University of California in Los Angeles, and we look at their prediction, they're not always the same, right? And it's like, well, we have an actual measure. It's like what's on the table for dinner versus what I think is going to be on the table based on, you know, the environment around your house. You see what I'm saying? And so we're finding that the aspiration that they have is really great, but the reliability of their test results is not as great. So I take the whole thing with a grain of salt, right? When it's 0.84, it's 0.89, it's point whatever. 
uh, in my last test, it came back at 0.89, just so you know, full disclosure. So um, I think that, um, you know, you take all that with a grain of salt. And I think going after the things that are most um, accelerating the aging process for the individual becomes really the key. And couple that with the right mindset of living young for a lifetime. And I think that's how you really get your best answer. The phenomenon that you're mentioning is called value capture. If you find one metric that you set your goal to and you try to optimize everything for that metric, then you are not going to 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 optimize for the, the other salient metrics that you could you could you could have attributes or things. Those are not not as clear as clear as a game. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Or as a sport, right? Like right. the rejuvenation Olympics. Right. So that's exactly right. It's a good insight that you have. I agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, but, but, you know, the right tool for the right, um, problem. Yeah. Right tool for the right problem. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I, I did, uh, did, did think about it uh, a lot and I did come to the conclusion that uh, this is not value capture what I'm doing here. I think interviewing the people who have a great Dunedin Pace score, uh, the best in the world, right, mm -hmm. is a very valuable thing to do. So it is good enough for that. And sure. it is good enough to have a rejuvenation Olympics, have some fun with it. Sure, sure. Yeah, there's no downside to it as long as people understand what it is and what it isn't. Maybe we get to a point where the bodybuilding community got right, where the volume is your, your muscle size and, and, and eventually bodybuilders get to the point where their muscle size is so high that everything else in, in their life is just, uh, just get volume captured by their muscle size and not even ladies look at them like they want to do something with them. So that's, that's a classic example of value capture here. And I don't know how this could happen with the, with the biological aging clock, but th th this should happen somehow, eventually something like this. Yes. I think that it's important for the audience to understand that, um, biology is really what I call an economy of balance. So we have a financial economy, right? And it's quite honestly, it's an economy of scarcity because there's never enough money, right? It's like, if you have, if you have billions of dollars, you're worried about losing it. If you, if you don't have enough money, you're trying to make some, if you have something in between being, you know, destitute and a billion dollars, you're still thinking about money. It's, it's, it's like, there's, there's always something that could happen, right? Maybe, maybe inflation takes it away or there's an invasion or whatever, right? So you're always worried about these things. So it's, to me, it's an economy of scarcity. And then on the love side of things, what we've learned is that the more love that we give away, right? The more, the more we give love away, the more love we end up having. So that's a, that's a very uh, additive kind of society, right? That's an abundance economy. And when you look at biology, Biology is actually an economy of balance. It likes to cycle through different states. It likes to be fasted. It likes to be fed. It likes to work out. It likes to recover. It likes to be awake. It likes to sleep, right? It likes to do autophagy. It likes to build muscle mass. It likes to do these things. It likes to swing through these different states. So biology is really an economy of balance. And if you say, well, I'm going to measure my health based on the fact that I can have the biggest muscle or the highest VO2 max or the most bone density, then you're you're by definition kind of pushing the the system out of balance to emphasize just one or two metrics that you're trying to go for, and I think measuring a mosaic of ages for people a, a whole metric gives you more of a sense of where they are on balance, and so that's why we're fans of of really number one playing what I call the symphony of longevity, where you're cycling in and out of different states, um, and then you're using a broader picture of aging to understand where you are in the aging process. Um, I think that that's leads to more balance. And, and also, you know, if I eat a piece of pie, it's like, okay, I eat a piece of pie. You know, there are people running around, oh, man, I wouldn't eat that. That's going to kill you. Do you know that's going to kill you? It's like, well, you know, but I'm here on planet Earth. And I happen to like, I like a piece of pie every now and then. So I'll eat a piece of pie. 
And it's like, okay, well, life is for living too at the same time, right? So I think and my biology can handle that. I know what my hemoglobin A1C is, what my fasting insulins are and all these things. I know all these things. So I know this is not going to hurt me. Um, but I think, I think people can get so swept up in this that they actually um, not only take all the joy out of it, but they try to take the joy out of it for everybody else. And then they, you know, I don't even know what they're actually accomplishing, quite honestly. So, yeah. <laughs> You used the word symphony there, and you talked about true age, uh, true diagnostics. Yeah. Um, did you did you use the word symphony? Uh, so, so I got I've the information the that they are a long time. Yeah, they have a new symphony age thing. Symphony that age, right? Yeah. And and <laughs> I've I've used the word symphony. Actually, I was the one who introduced it to to oh, really? uh, Ryan. <laughs> yeah. So and, and they adopted it. Apparently, I didn't. I, I, Symphony of Longevity is a trademarked uh, thing for glad and longevity, uh, but they they have oh, their really? own symphony. Yeah, but it's a it's a great term, right? I mean, it does. I think it captures it. All right, let's talk about your trade. What is your trade? My what now? You have something that you offer to the world, and the world yes. gives you money for it. Oh yes. What's oh. your trade? My trade. Okay, my trade. Got it. My you know my passion is really to change what I call the glide path of aging for the entire planet. You know, I saw my, my grandparents go through their own decline, right? And I heard my grandmother tell me over and over again, Jeff, you don't ever want to get old. It's hell to get old. You don't ever want to get old. I heard that so many times. And then my mother, as she got older, started to say the same thing. Jeff, you don't ever want to get old. It's hell to get old. And I saw my father die with dementia. I saw I had an older sister that was mentally handicapped from a, a birth trauma that she experienced with she didn't get enough oxygen to her brain. Um, she was on seizure medications her entire life and then died at about age 70. Uh, she was about age 70 when she passed. My mother died with macular degeneration and osteoporosis. I had a grandfather that lived to 97, a grandmother that lived to 96. My mother was 93, my dad was 89. And yet I saw these people that were actually very vibrant and had so much to contribute to the world decline and lose their abilities to, to make those contributions. And I, I just feel like it's such a tragedy for us to do that. I don't, want, I don't want people to have to go through those declines. And so my real mission in life is to crack the code on aging so that we can all have a better future. What I do here at Gladden Longevity is to work with people that are really passionate about optimizing their life, if you will, not only their biology, but their psychology, their spirituality, everything about it, their relationships. And we work to really unravel the knot for them. What are their genetics? You can't win this game if you don't know what cards you're holding. And the cards you're holding are your genetics. What, what are your genetics? What are you predisposed to? What are your assets? What are your liabilities? Because if you don't know those, you can never win, right? You have to know what cards you're holding. And then the other next question becomes, well, where are you in the game, right? Where are you in the game? And this is where you need to measure a whole mosaic of different, many, many ages. So you know where you are, right? Maybe your DNA methylation age looks good. Maybe your dunedin pace looks good, but maybe you've got kidney disease, right? Maybe you've got heart disease or something else, right? So you have to, you have to take the broad swipe there. And then beyond that, you have to ask, actually have to understand where you are relative to the hallmarks of aging, right? So we're now up to about 16 hallmarks of aging, which are both expressions of aging, right? Like the mitochondria getting weaker, the telomeres getting shorter, you know, cell recleaning and autophagy not taking place, but they're also drivers of aging, right? So senescent cells show up, they're, they're a, a phenotypic, what's called a phenotypic expression of aging. They're their evidence that aging is occurring, but they also potentiate and accelerate the aging process, right? So they're both a, a measure of aging and also a contributor to aging. And if you don't know where you are relative to those 16 things, then you're never going to win. And so what we do is we, we are in the process of trying to measure all 16. We can't measure all 16 just yet, but we can measure about 12 of them, 10 or 12 of them. And that's a big that's a big leg up for people if they can actually see where they are. So now you know what cards you're holding. Now you know where you are in the game. And now you can actually create what I call an exponential strategy, an exponential problem. When you combine the right mindset, when you combine 
focusing on longevity itself, which is those hallmarks of aging. You focus on all the health metrics, and then you focus on your ability to perform well, right? Like when I'm 100, I want to be fast, agile, strong, quick, balanced, with great cardiovascular endurance, recovery, and great flexibility. So if I'm going to be that at 100, I need to be that today. I need to be that now. And so I, I work diligently to be that today. And in order to do that, I have to train. I do balance training. I do interval training. I, do, I ride my mountain bike. I, I do all surf. I body surf. I do all kinds of things because I want to stay super fit and flexible and healthy physically. I don't ever say, oh, yeah, but you know, you're 70 years old. You shouldn't do that. It's like, no, I can do this safely. I can put on the right protective gear. I can go do the things I want to do. So I think this exponential strategy really has to include all those things that I just mentioned, the life energy circle, which is all the mindset, psycho-spiritual pieces, the longevity circle, all the hallmarks, then all the health metrics, all the performance metrics. And the last thing that I've added since I wrote the book is to focus on the environment. We all live in basically four environments, right? We live at home, work, business travel, and vacation travel. That's probably 98% of where we spend our time. And then we live in environments that we either control or environments where we don't control, right? When you walk outside, you're walking into an uncontrolled environment. Um, and so how do you actually take as much control as you can and have a strategy to make each environment enable you to effortlessly implement the things that you want to implement to keep you on a healthy path, right? What's in the refrigerator? What's in the freezer? What's in the, what's in the pantry? What kinds of foods are in the house? Where are your sneakers? How are you going to exercise in the morning? How are you going to do that? You make it as easy as possible by architecting that environment. Now you're really starting to make progress, right, towards implementing this exponential strategy. So that's how I see it. What's your environment is like? Um, my environment, each of my, I live, I live either in Dallas or in Puerto Rico, and each environment is constructed to where I have a space to get up in the morning and meditate. I journal and I meditate first thing. Then I have access to being able to work out, whether it's raining outside or sunny and sunny outside. I, I have different activities. Um, I have workout uh, equipment in Dallas in my, in my home, and I have workout equipment in in Puerto Rico in my home. I have access to gyms as well. Um, but when it when I can get outside, um, I always go outside. I go for a run. I go for a mountain bike. I ride my elliptigo. And when I'm in Puerto Rico, I'll body surf or I'll stand up paddle and go out. I paddle a half mile offshore and catch waves out there and ride waves. Um, so I'm always doing something, right? Um, and then I have balance boards all over the place that I jump on to kind of train my balance. I do it with my eyes closed, right? Indo boards, dynamic boards where you're you know, people will say, I couldn't do that. I'm going to fly off. And it's like, well, let me show you how to do it safely. And then you get to a point where you can do all this with your eyes closed. Now your whole nervous system is being trained. And so really, when you think about training, what it really boils down to is training the nervous system, whether it's your brain in terms of how you think and how you feel or your body in terms of how you move and respond. So understanding that we're really training our nervous system then you get new insights into, okay, well, how do I make my nervous system? How can I shoot a basketball better? How can I hit a golf ball better? How can I do so You start to get into these questions and that leads to progress. So super fun. So, so, so you do many different kind yeah. of exercise or not even That's exercise right. play thing. That's right. A lot That's of play. Right. Yeah. I do it for mm -hmm. joy. I'm all, I only do things that bring me joy. This is another key thing. I don't, I'm not, I'm not forcing myself to do stuff. I find that the things I do, everything brings me joy, right? The journaling brings me joy. The meditation brings me joy. The workouts bring me joy. And if it's, if it's it, nobody, you know, you can never sustain something that's tr that's drudgery, right? You can never sustain something that you have to force yourself to do. It's unsustainable. And so you need to, for me, i if I'm not feeling joy, then I'm not going to do it, right? And that's true for relationships, conversations. This is a joyful conversation for me, the chance to share ideas. Um, I only do things that bring me joy. And I think if people take that attitude towards it's like, oh, this is going to be, this is going to be fun. This is going to be joyful. It's like, oh, okay, yeah, let's, let's do that. You see, I, I also have some contribution to make on the internet because I figured out something that uh, I haven't heard anyone 
doing this before, yeah. which is a long time ago, I was working out in the morning and I like to work out in the morning. It's mm -hmm. just, I decided to put my workout in the afternoon and prioritize my work in the morning instead. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but I decided to do something in the morning. And what I figured is that, well, there is the internet, there is YouTube, and there are many, many uh, five to 15 minutes follow along exercises mm -hmm. of, uh, of all kinds of topics. So a year ago, what I started to do is to every week, I choose a follow along exercise video exercise and i mean exercise in a very broad sense it it can be uh primal movements uh, street workout bodybuilding bodybuilding posing uh karate uh, even at one time when uh, my family went away i did some uh very very funky uh thing that taiwanese people do in the parks <laughs> Okay, okay, dancing. Yeah. I don't right. know. So, 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 mm -hmm. so, so I figured that I do some follow along video, and I right now I can say that I am doing everything that that is in the world, and every time I'm learning some new kinds of movements, and it's it. uh, it's it's great. I love it, um, and you're having fun doing it, right? It's it's it oh, brings yeah. you joy. Yeah. Right? Here it is. Yeah. It's, if you're listening to this, what's magical about what he's saying is that he's doing this not because he feels like he has to. He's doing it because he finds it fun. And I would encourage you to think about the things that bring you joy and go after those. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, you can follow your interest. That's right. You always wanted to. Tra I always wanted. I I I heard that you are playing. You were playing a lot of soccer football right i grew up playing soccer i played a little mm -hmm. soccer in college before my chemistry major kind of took me away from playing soccer but yeah i enjoyed soccer mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. me as well and now finally i just played soccer last week in nice. my in my bedroom right just playing with the ball like that was my my, my workout yeah um all right uh so let's 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 get back to you um do you have any vices? Any vices? Um, well, I do like a I do like a piece of pie uh, every now and then. That would be a vice, I suppose. Um, I like to drive fast. Um, I have a long history of motorsports, um, riding dirt bikes and motorcycles, and I've I've ridden motorcycles all over the world. I've spent a fair amount of time on race tracks. I used to race go karts. I used to race cars. Now I've kind of supplanted all that with um, riding my mountain bike. I get as all the speed and thrills of everything riding the mountain bike. It's so fun. Other vices, I don't really drink. Um, I'm not a big fan of alcohol because it, it disrupts my sleep. So I, I don't really drink. I don't smoke. I don't use tobacco products. I don't know. I think it, it would probably have to be more around eating something that technically isn't good for me. Like I might go to a party and somebody's having ice cream and I'll have a bowl of ice cream with them or something like that. It's probably more along, it's probably more along food choices uh, would be vices. But other than that, that and driving too fast, I don't, I don't have a lot of vices actually. I, I kind of, I find that vices don't necessarily bring me joy. That being said, um, I do like pushing into new things. Uh, my partner and I, she and I are pushing into a bunch of new conversations, new things, new fun things to do together. Um, and I find great joy in continuing to expand and grow, right? I call it becoming our unencumbered selves to where we really uh, become the full expression of who we are and we can bring all our gifts forward. So I find that to be super fun. Yeah. Yeah, that's beautiful. What's what's your tribe? Uh, who are the people you spend the most time with? Uh, family, your partner, your colleagues, children? Uh, well, first off, my family. I'm very close to my kids. I have four children. I have uh, four grandchildren, five grandchildren actually. Um, and so I'm close to I'm close to each of them. I talk to them frequently. Uh, none of them live close to me. Uh, my partner and I have been together for about a year and a half. And that's become really, 
kind of a love for the ages. We're building a love for the ages is what we're doing. And that's led to many, many really interesting conversations, what I call courageous conversations, where you're willing to risk the relationship to bring something forward that is really on your heart. And when you do that, and the other person is willing to listen uh, and kind of receive that gently, um, there's so much opportunity for growth. I mean, it's just, it's crazy. I find relationships, many people start to push things down. It's like, well, we're doing good, so we won't talk about that. Right. I don't want to bring that up because it might it might disrupt the flow that we currently have. And in our world, we're, we're not afraid to do that. We're we're basically saying, no, let's bring that up because I want to know you more deeply. I want to understand you more deeply. Right. And so when you take that approach, all of a sudden the relationship in and of itself becomes incredibly interesting. Uh, it doesn't ever become stale. So we spend a lot of time together doing things like that. I have great friends. I've had friends all the way through. Uh, from childhood, actually. When I had my 50th birthday, I reached out to my best friend from every era of my life, like five years old, when I was in grade school, when I was in high school, when I was in college, when I was in medical school, best friends I'd had throughout my life. And it was really fun to reconnect with some of those people. I hadn't talked to them in a long time, but you know, within two minutes, we were back just being great friends again. And it was such a fun thing to be able to do that. So I stay in touch with several of my friends uh, that I've had for, for decades, quite honestly. And then I like, I like being around people that are entrepreneurial and I like being around people that are also in the psycho-spiritual space and people that are also in the health space and the longevity space. So those are kind of, I have different tribes, I suppose. Yeah. Oh, and I love people that are athletic, like mountain bikers and snowboarders and surfers and stuff like that. So yeah, lots of different tribes. Yes. All right. Everyone is the hero of their own story. That's right. Um, what's your hero's journey? Mm, wow, that's interesting. I, when I give talks now, I actually talk about the hero's journey. And I think the hero's journey that I think we're all on um, is to claim our birthright to live young for a lifetime. That's my hero's journey. My hero's journey is to expand into the full expression of who I am, unencumbered by past traumas. Um, you know, we've all, we've all undergone trauma. Everybody that has, has had traumatic experiences and our psychologies are such that we live in reaction to those traumas. Um, and so then we're, you know, well, I wouldn't do that again, or I'm going to do this differently or whatever, right? We live in reaction to those traumas. Um, and some of that can be healthy and good, but some of it can actually put us to where we're actually biased in the way we think and see things that aren't particularly healthy. And so I think being able to go back and understand those traumas and then heal those traumas and then transcend those traumas to where you become grateful for everything that happened because it actually brought you to this place. And now you become unencumbered. You become unencumbered by those traumas to where you're actually able to be your full expression of yourself without having to live in response to those traumas. See, I think this is part of my idea of the 300 year old mind and living young for a lifetime, right? Um, so I think, I think that's how I would describe it. All right. Now I would like to talk a bit more about, uh, just the usual stuff, what people think your secret lies, in, what supplements you take, eating, what, what do you do? Do you sleep well? And if yes, what do you do for sleeping to sleep well? <laughs> yeah. So I, I prioritize sleep. I would say six out of seven nights a week. There may be one night I stay up a bit later, you know, if if we go out or we do something. But anyway, I tend to prioritize sleep. So I sleep with blackout curtains. I sleep in a cold room, uh, about 66 degrees Fahrenheit. I have a chili pad uh, that cools the bed and I put that at the lowest setting possible. I'm warm. So I put it at the lowest setting possible. So I'm in a cool room on a cool mattress in a dark room that's silent. I don't wear an eye mask or anything, but then I've been taking different supplements that have uh, some melatonin in them, some L-theanine. I'm now using a new product that has a special form of CBD in it called HRV. Um, and that's very good for kind of calming the nervous system. I'm not a, I'm not a, an anxious person, but, um, I sort of play around with different supplements at bedtime, um, for sleep. And I find that I'm sleeping really, really well. Like I wake up about once a night to go use the bathroom and that's about it. 
Um, and sometimes I'll sleep all the way through, although that's more rare. But I'm, I'm pretty pleased with my sleep. The other thing I do is I don't set an alarm. Like I did set an alarm today, which is unusual, but typically I don't set an alarm. Uh, I set an alarm today because I had an appointment that I had to get to before I got to work and blah, blah, blah. Not even the chilly sleep, uh, making it warm alarm. No, no I just huh? leave it cold the whole time. I know that I know it can adapt and wake you up in the morning, but I, I allow my body to sleep as long as it needs to sleep. And so I typically don't start my day until nine or 10 o'clock in the morning, my work day, which gives me time to sleep in until seven or seven thirty or even eight o'clock and still get up and meditate and do the things I want to do and, and that kind of thing. So I think I found that really helpful. You know, when I practiced interventional cardiology for 25 years and all the training, I was getting uh, awakened all the time in the middle of the night to answer calls, to go to the hospital, all that sort of thing. And so one of the gifts I gave myself when I left that was to say, I'm not, I'm not going to take call and I'm going to sleep as long as I need to sleep. And so that's been kind of one of my strategies. <laughs> yeah. I like to sleep as long as I need to sleep as well. Right. So what about nutrition? Uh, when do you eat? How many times? How strict are you? Um, tell me about your nutrition. Yeah. So, you know, I would say that um, what works for me, and it's different for different people, but what works for me is more of a plant-based, nutritionally dense diet. So I had the opportunity to be in Turkey uh, when I was a college student. I traveled there. We were doing a, um, I went to a school where we were studying biblical, it was a biblical studies. And so we started in Greece, we went to Turkey, we went to Israel, we ended up in Rome, you know, that kind of a thing. But when I was in Turkey, I was so impressed with the food there. I felt like it was the best food I'd ever had on the planet. Because we were staying in like these small towns, we were only there for three or four days, but we would stay in like small towns and go into a village and have some food. And the food was so fresh and nutrient dense and so flavorful. I thought, oh my gosh, this is the best food I've ever eaten. And there was some meat, but it wasn't so meat heavy. It, there were lots of vegetables and lots of grains and lots of different things going on. And, and so I really have always loved eating that way. So now I eat uh, predominantly plants. I'll eat, I'll eat animal protein, maybe four or five days a week, maybe three to four days a week, depending on the week, but I don't eat it every day. And I really look for nutrient density. The body likes variety. So the other thing I do is I don't eat the same thing over and over and over again. Uh, so I like many, many things. Like today I'm having some raspberries, some bok choy, some hummus. Uh, I forget what else I brought with me to the work. Um, oh, I know some, some carrots and some uh, celery and some things like that. Uh, and, you know, last night, let's see. Well, we went out to lunch yesterday, I had some eggs, eggs Benedict, but, but, but just with vegetables, artichoke and tomato and things like that, and a couple of eggs. Uh, and last night I had a piece of chicken. Um, and I don't eat a heavy dinner. I'm a big fan of not eating a heavy dinner. So I tend to not eat in the morning till after I've worked out. Many times I don't eat anything until 10 or 11 in the morning. Um, then I'll eat a pretty decent lunch. And then my dinner is typically pretty light, but I kind of fit most of my eating into about an eight hour window. Sometimes I'll fit it into a six hour window. But the interesting thing is that there was a study that came out showing that people that eat one meal a day have an 80% increase in cardiovascular events like heart attacks and strokes, and also an 80% increase in death. And so Part of the thing is we know that fasting is very healthy, but eating all of our calories in one meal puts such a big load on the body to deal with those calories that we're better off if we do want to fast is to spread our meals out into smaller portions throughout whatever window we want to be eating them. So if it's a six hour window or an eight hour window, I would encourage people to eat a small amount. Never eat until you're full. Just eat until you feel like, oh, I'm okay for now and then kind of come back to it. So that's that's kind of how I plan my eating. But nutrient density is really important for me. Um, so things like kale, arugula, spinach, bok choy, uh, Swiss chard, collard greens, all those things are incredibly nutrient dense. We get so many nutrients per calorie and I love eating those really nutrient dense foods. They're very flavorful. It's kind of like the food I ate in Turkey, I thought. How many pills do you take a day? 
How many pills? I haven't counted them to tell you the truth, but I'm going to say it's probably somewhere between 80 and 100 pills a day. Mm, okay, so yeah. big supplements yeah. stuck there. Yeah, so I take a couple supplements. Yeah, but I'm taking things that, that I've tested for and I know are particularly good for me, right, based on my genetics or my nutrient testing or some other testing that I've done. I don't just take stuff because somebody says, oh, you should try this. I mean, I will try stuff just to try it, but typically what I settle into is really based on the testing results. Yeah. All right. Uh, give me an overview of your supplements. Um, well, it's focused on um, different categories, right? So I, I take some different things for mitochondrial function, like urolithin A. Um, I like molecular hydrogen a lot. Uh, I def definitely do that. Personally, genetically, I need B vitamins to make my methylation cycle work properly. So I take quite a few B vitamins, plus I burn through them with all the workouts that I do. Um, I do some B12 injections about every three to four weeks. Um, I also will take uh, spermidine to increase autophagy at bedtime. I think that's really good. Um, and I take uh, Tikrin to make my brain really sharp. It's basically a derivative of T, um, T-H-E-R-C-I-N-E, Tikrin, C-R-I-N-E. Uh, and <clears throat> I find that that's uh, really great for cognitive ability and being sharp. Um, so I like taking that. I take things to decrease inflammation because of my kidney disease. I take some things that help my kidneys to work better. I take a little rapamycin. Uh, also for aging uh, intermittently, about every three weeks. Um, and I don't really take medi many medications. I take a little Ramipril for my kidneys, which is an ACE inhibitor. And the rest of it is things like omega-3s. I've become a fat of fatty 15, <clears throat> which is a new essential fatty acid um, that's connected to uh, cell membrane structure um, and youthfulness. Uh, it was discovered in dolphins. So C15 or what? Yeah, carbon 15. It's C15 called fatty, oh, yeah, yeah. fatty 15. You may have heard about it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I take Is that things. Legit? What's that? <laughs> is that legit? Is it logic? I, I just heard about it. Uh, yes. So, so oh, that's is it something legitimate? new. Is it legitimate? Uh -huh. Yeah, I think it is legitimate. It's right now we don't have long term data on it. We just have association. Uh, and you can get it from food. You can get it from whole fat dairy and you can get it from meat. Um, but I like the concept of it. It's when you look at all the different things that it activates, um, this has been studied in great detail. It actually activates more longevity uh, and counteracts more, hormark, more, more hallmarks of aging than even rapamycin does. So I, it, you know, it's not going to hurt me. So it's like, okay, this is good. I'll, I'll try this and see how it works out. Um, sometimes I take some things to the length of my telomeres, things for inflammation. I was going to say about my kidneys, uh, I tend to run more inflammation. So I take special pro resolving mediators to decrease inflammation. And I use peptides also, right? I like peptides that improve brain derived neurotrophic factor, like C-Lank. I use some CJC with epimorlin. I use some testosterone and some DHEA. And occasionally I'll take BioPro Plus, which is full of trophic factors like IGF-1 and, and really a whole list of trophic factors that build bone density and muscle. Um, and I tend to cycle in and out of that, right? When I take testosterone, I'll take some of the, some of the growth hormone releasing peptides and some of the other uh, BioPro Plus. And then when I'm at the end of my testosterone, before I'm going to dose again, I'd stay away from it. When I take rapamycin, I just use testosterone and none of the other stuff and a little bit lower dose of testosterone then. So I try to cycle in and out of these different states, but I do know that the body in general likes variety. So I tend not to do the same thing all the time every day. And there'll be some days I don't take many supplements. It's just like, oh, I'm just going to take a break. Um, so I do that too. I see. I see. All right. Putting aside exercise, putting aside sleep, putting aside um, supplements. Um, do, you, do you do something extra like hyperbarics or something extra that people don't usually do. Yeah, so saunas are very important. I also do some things to boost NAD um, in my supplements. And I like ozone. I like ozone saunas and I like Ibu uh, because ozone um, kind of activates your, it's kind of a hormetic stress like exercise is. It increases your body's ability to deal with oxidative stress. It's also very healing. It decreases pain if somebody has pain and we inject ozone into a joint, for example. 
Um, but it also improves the NAD to NADH ratio so that all of a sudden you have more energy and you can do more things. So I think ozone's really, really great. Sorry, are you talking about ozone therapy? Like when you, your blood goes out and some ozone yes. stuff happens and it comes I'm back? Yeah. Yes, I'm talking about that, but I'm also talking about an ozone sauna where you can sit in a sauna, your head, you can't breathe ozone, right? Because it's, it's harsh on oh, the lungs, okay. but you sit in a sauna with your head out and you're absorbing the ozone through your skin. And that works very well. Interesting, interesting. Mm -hmm. I got an opportunity to do the ozone therapy, but uh, I was like, oh, no, this is too much for me. <laughs> gotcha. Maybe next time. Maybe next time. Um, is there any other athletes? you know, from the longevity Olympics leaderboard? Well, I know several of my clients are are ahead of me on the board. I have some people that are ranked in the top few, I believe. Uh, I know it changes from time to time, but we have a number of clients that we work with that are um, on the leaderboard for sure. Uh, you know, the other, one of the other things that we're doing is we're starting to use young plasma here where you can, in the state of Texas here, we can, we can legally... Uh, you know, harvest young plasma. It's being harvested by a blood bank, not by us, but from college students. And then we can give it to older people. And young plasma has a lot of benefits for people. Um, the We also do plasmapheresis where we take out old plasma and get rid of it. And we can replace that old plasma either with saline and albumin, or we can give young plasma back. And then we do stem cell procedures here as well. Um, what it turns out, though, is that as somebody's getting older, getting the bad stuff out becomes as important as putting the good stuff in. So we're big fans of plasmapheresis to get rid of the bad stuff, then replacing it with young plasma, and then adding stem cells and peptides at that point, because the stem cells will work. Stem cells will work much better in a younger environment than you do in an older environment. So being able to do all that. Um, can be very regenerative and I do that periodically also. Tomorrow I will have Diane Ginsberg. Uh, she's talking about yes. uh, uh, young plasma, plasma young yeah. plasma as well. Yeah. Um, I had a theory of uh, theory or or an idea. Could this could the res results of the rejuvenation Olympics because you know you're you're taking you're taking this result from blood and and then if you put a young person's blood inside you, then uh, then then that would make make everything a bit more well. Yeah, uh, fake. So you're not putting <laughs> you're not putting young blood in yourself, just so you understand. You're just putting the plasma in. Right. So oh, only the plasma. The, only the plasma. You're not putting ah, in. Cells OK, or, OK. Yeah, and they the, are testing the white blood cells. So. Correct. Correct. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So you are creating a more youthful environment, which enables cells to function better in general, whether they're your own or if you're getting stem cells. And it has been shown, and Diane has shown this in some slides, that um, when you use young plasma, you can slow down your rate of aging also. So yes, there are hacks like this that enable us to do that. Now, I hadn't, the last time I checked in my my rate of aging or checked it. Um, I hadn't done any of these things. I just came in and, and had done this to see where I was at. Um, but if I, if I do another series of, um, stem cells and plasma phoresis and young plasma, I suspect my, my rate of aging will fall again. Um, so I'll probably do that here in the next few weeks, quite honestly. Talking about young blood and talking about billionaire, want to bring up Peter Thiel. So, the contrary and question is the key to entrepreneurship, according to Peter Thiel and to value creation, according to me, to have some secret knowledge, some insight into the world that most people disagree with. The familiar world is where people have consensus, eat well, exercise and sleep a lot. The unfamiliar world is where your secret insight lies, the knowledge you have that most people would disagree with. What important truth do very few people agree with you on? Well, I think um, I think the thing that's unknown to many people is that there is an option to live young for a lifetime. 
because it's not anything that we see in our families. It's not taught in our schools. It's not suggested by our physicians. It's not in the medical system. Uh, even in our businesses, when we get to a certain age, we're expected to retire, things like this. This whole aging process is reinforced. And I think what's what's unusual is to say, no, um, I'm going to live young for a lifetime. I'm 27, right? That's very unusual for people to say that. And I think that's there's a secret power there that people don't realize. And I also think that people are so caught up and can be so caught up in their day-to-day -day activities, making a living, caring for families, you know, all these communities, all these things, that they lose sight of what's the purpose? Why am I really here? Is it just to be a caretaker of these things or is there a bigger purpose for me? And so I think this whole psycho-spiritual space of stepping into this full expression of who you are and living an unencumbered life, being free to live young for a lifetime, right? These things are different concepts than most people are thinking about. And so I'm I'm always happy to share them. And it's interesting how they resonate with people. Um, but at the same time, some people will say, no, I'm fine. I'm, I don't need that. I'm happy to get older. I'm happy to do whatever. And that's obviously their choice. But for many people, when they hear it, particularly entrepreneurs, it's like, oh, I could have another 30 years. I thought I was going to have another five. Now I can have another 30, 40 years. It's like, this is great news. There's so much stuff I want to do. So, um, you know, that's. I think that's kind of a, uh, at the center of the secret knowledge. Um, the technologies are all out there, right? Everybody knows the different technologies, right? Um, it's just, but I think the magic is in how you lace them together, right? How you actually sequence them and what the timing is and how you measure and how you keep track of what's happening. I think there's some, some less than common knowledge there uh, is what I find. Most people that I talk to in the longevity space don't fully comprehend that. They think, oh, I have stem cells. Let me give you stem cells. It's like, well, Okay, that's all right, but it's not not nearly as good as it could be. Mm -hmm. So talk is cheap. What actually matters is what the market tests you for. Yeah. So my question is, how can people give you money? <laughs> how can they that's give you money? how you can give the most value to them, right? Sure. Sure. Well, I think that <clears throat> um there are several different things that we're involved in. One is to become a client of ours. People will write us a check for that to do all the testing, to put all the pieces together, to let them know what their genetics show, where they are in the game, and put together a program for them and work with us. They for have a year. to go to the U.S. To yeah, the they need, right States. now, right now they would need to come to Texas. Uh, we have people that come internationally from Europe, Dubai, places like that. Uh, we're talking to a guy from, and his wife from Brazil right now, but yes, um, currently coming to the U.S. And then people will work with us for a year, really, for transformation. And then people will stay on and do second, third, fourth, fifth year, whatever. Particulars are seeing more and more progress. So that's one way. Another way is, you know, if you're interested, you can always purchase the book. 100 is the new 30. Because um, you can get that on Amazon. It's also on Audible. And so I'm working on getting it translated into other languages, but currently it's in English. The other thing is we have a podcast called the Glad and Longevity Podcast that people can listen to. And we have, we've done over 230 or I don't even know how many, but somewhere over 230 shows now. And there's a ton of really interesting information on there about different products and different ideas and different things that, that we're interested in sharing. And then we have a supplement shop. If people want to come in and buy supplements, they can do that too. So those are ways that people can reach out to us. The other way is that we're involved. We have a research arm to our, to our practice also where we, we have two full-time researchers that work for us. Um, so we're doing trials, IRB approved trials. And if people want to participate in the trials, they can reach out to us. Some of these they need to pay to participate because we don't have outside funding for them. And then we also have a not-for-profit, however, and we're working with a woman right now, Karen Dark. I don't know if you're familiar with Karen Dark. Um, she's, mm -hmm. uh, she's from uh, England and Scotland. She was in her 20s. She had a mountain climbing accident, fell and broke her, her back and is paraplegic and has been paraplegic for about 30, close to 30 years now. And she went on to win the Paralympic uh, Games gold medal in Rio de Janeiro uh, as a racer. And she's an unbelievable person. She just climbed Mount Kilimanjaro. She's, you know, she's always doing something amazing, right? And she's very inspirational. And we're trying to pull together about $150,000 to be able to 
and, and we're not taking any profit from it, but we just want to provide testing for her and get her access to different stem cell therapies and peptides and things that we think might have the ability to restore her ability to walk. And she's very interested in that, of course. And we know that paraplegics um, live about 20 years short less than, than people that are able to walk. Uh, obviously, she's incredibly active, but she has her own health issues, of course, as well. And so uh, this is a not-for-profit thing, again, that if people want to make a donation, they could go to Karen Dark and look it up. It's Karen, K-A-R-E-N, Dark, D-A-R-K-E, Karen Dark. If you go to her website, just look at karendark.com. It's incredibly, when I first read her website, I had tears running down my cheeks. I was like, oh my gosh, what an amazing human being. So we're trying to help her. So that's another way if people want to engage with us. Dr. Jeffrey Gladden, it was a privilege. Thank you very much. Oh, my pleasure. <laughs>